Uh, we've been studying the book of Isaiah, and this is kind of a little different thing we're doing tonight because there's a certain pattern. How many like patterns? I am a mathematician at heart. I love patterns. And what we're going to see tonight is, and we've been studying Isaiah with an eye toward uh, the New Testament and what Jesus said and how many times it's referenced. And one of the big issues that Isaiah is dealing with in this particular part of Isaiah, uh, really chapters 27 through about 32, is he's really dealing with judgment. Judgment specifically on Jerusalem. A judgment that will come but not happen. <laughs> not fully happen. And that just reminded me of the way God does judgment. How many remember the book of Judges? The book of Judges, basically God told the people as they went out into the land, hey, if you listen to me, if you follow my words, I will bless you. If you don't, I will punish you, right? Pretty simple. I will do that. What did the people decide to do? The very next generation came along, and they did not keep God in their heart, and they went after the gods of the land. So what did God do? He came in, day one, judgment, wiped them off the face of the earth, right? Came in and took them completely out of the land, right? No. He came in with a little judgment. A little area of the promised land for just a few years, and then they turned back to him, and he let them go. But that very next generation did what? Went after the gods of the land. So God came in with a longer judgment, a broader judgment, a more difficult judgment, until the people repented. And then the next generation, what? Did the same thing. But each time the judgment got what? More severe. What is God's point in doing that, do you think? So that they will what? Learn. <laughs> you don't start with the maximum penalty, do you? You start with a little penalty to remind them who's in charge. And that's what he did with them. And it got to the point where little by little, and then he came up with some really rough ones by the end, didn't he? And even by the end, uh, God almost threw up his hands and said, well, they're just not going to get it. <laughs> so they want a king, I'll give them a king, and that's going to be even worse than anything I could do to them, right? I mean, it's just, time of the judge is a good example of the spiraling judgment. Well, really, we're going to see the same thing tonight. And we're going to look at Isaiah and Jeremiah and the Gospels and see these judgments on Jerusalem. The judgment of the Assyrians, which would have been during the time of who? Isaiah. The judgment of Babylon, which would have been during the time of who? Jeremiah. The judgment of the Romans, which was after the time of who? Jesus, right? And then we're going to see the judgment by God. <laughs> And see how it all fits in as well. And we're going to try to see tonight what was the problem, what was the judgment, and also what hope there was, because there's always hope. And then what? What do we do? And we're going to see a pattern here that in each one, really, he wanted the same things to happen. Okay? So you ready to go? Who's excited about this? All right, let's go look at some patterns. Let's start with the Assyrians. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 29. And let's see what the problem was. Isaiah chapter 29, we're going to be looking at verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 29, verse 13 says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. Okay? So what was the problem? The problem was their heart was far from them, even though, again, let me reiterate, because I keep coming back to this, were they being religious? And were they even in their minds being religious toward the one true God? Yet, yeah, yeah, they had some high places. That was always a problem. There were always those grows. But overall, in the king, 
on down through the priests, on down through the people. What was in their mouth was prayers to God. What was their praise was praise to God. They were bringing their sacrifices. They were coming for their prayers. They were doing their festivals. They were doing everything that God wanted to do except what? Love him. (laughs) And their heart was far from him. And they were teaching the precepts of man. They were teaching religion rather than love. Do this, do this, do this. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. If you do that, then you no longer love God. And if you don't do that, then you don't love God. Meanwhile, that's not love. (laughs) Love does not work that way, does it? And their heart was far from him. In fact, we find elsewhere in Isaiah, he talked about the fact that the fact that their heart was far from God meant their heart was also away from one another. They did not love those in need. They did not care for the widows. They did not care for the orphans. They did not care about justice. They cared more about corruption and money and things of this world. And their heart was turned against God, even though they were being religious. Their heart was still far from God. Is that a problem? So what does God say he was going to do? Isaiah chapter 29. Let's jump back up to verse 1. We saw this last week. Isaiah 29, 1. Woe to Ariel. Ariel is a name given, he gives here to Jerusalem. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices, yet I will distress Ariel. Again, do your sacrifices, but it's not going to do you any good. What do you say back in Isaiah chapter 1? Knock it off. (laughs) If you're not going to come and do them from your heart, stop doing them. If you bring sacrifices without a love for God, what are you doing? Just killing animals. Is that what God wants? No. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel, and I will camp against thee round about, and will lay siege against thee with a mount, and I will raise forts against thee, and thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. I am going to bring who? The Assyrians, the same ones that destroyed who? Israel, the ten tribes of the north. I'm going to bring them down, and they're going to camp against you, and they're going to distress you. They're going to cause problems to you, and you are going to have to humble yourself, right? Judgment is coming. But he says something else very important. Verse 5. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and a multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passes away. Yet it shall be at an instant suddenly thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire and the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munition and that distresser shall be as a dream and a night vision they will come they will distress they will cause stress they will cause fear they will come but they will not prevail he says and that's what happened the assyrians came sennacherib came he surrounded the city cried great distress hunger within the city everybody was scared to death they started going off to other people to try to find help and god said what be gone And an angel came down and wiped them all out. So what was this judgment? I'm going to remind you I can. (laughs) I'm going to remind you that Assyria, if I let Assyria do it, what could Assyria do? Lay you down to dust. (laughs) It can wipe you out in a moment. It can do anything it wants to do if I let them. I'm just not going to let them. But should we still learn? Should we learn? from judgment that isn't that bad? In fact, when's the best time to learn? When judgment ain't that bad. (laughs) That's an excellent time to learn, isn't it? (laughs) Learn from that time, yet did they? Of course not. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17. In fact, things got pretty bad uh, after Hezekiah. 
Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Jeremiah 17, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of their altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. O my mountain the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil. And thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And thou... Even thyself shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in that land which thou knowest not. For you have kindled a fire in mine anger which shall burn forever. He's not happy. Can you get that from that passage? He's not happy. It's written on a table. It's inscribed how bad these people are because they are going still after other gods, aren't they? Look at verses 9 and 10. What's the problem? It's the same problem. The heart is deceitful above all things, a desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Their heart still was what? Far from them. And at this point, they weren't being very religious, were they? <laughs> Now, during Josiah, which Jeremiah also prophesied during that time, there was a bit of a revival, but they went right back to it, didn't they? Back to other gods, away from the sacrifices, away from the things of God. Even against the things that they were doing during Isaiah, they even got further away from God. So what was God going to do this time? I'm sending the Babylonians. Chapter uh, 25. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 4. He reminds them in chapter 25, verse 4 of Jeremiah, The Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn you again now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given you and to your fathers forever and ever. Right? And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord. Did he warn them? That you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof, against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. God is not going to save them this time from invasion. They're going to break down that city. <laughs> They're going to take the people. Verse 10. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle, and this whole land shall be a desolation and astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king Babylon Forever? 70 years. There's the hope, right? Okay, this time, when they come and surround, I'm not going to send an angel to death. <laughs> I'm not going to come down and drive them away. I'm not going to do that. They're coming in, and they're going to destroy, and they're going to take, and they're going to take the people like who? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. We know the story, don't we? They're going to come in, and they're going to take your prize. They're going to take your people. They're going to take your money. You're going to take all the treasures of your House of God, they're going to take it all. But for only how long? Only 70 years. Is that better? <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> By the way, is 70 years a long time? I know, it seems small, right, when you start looking at all these numbers in the Bible. But is 70 years a long time? Yes. For how many of this would be your entire life so far? <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's a long time to wait. So if you were born when this happened, you're getting out when you're 70 years old. Yeah, 
seems, especially when you talk Bible, right? It seems, <laughs> that's right, yeah, exactly right. So is he going to bring judgment this time? Yes. What, what's the problem? Again, their heart, a heart that led them not just to not loving God, not doing things for the right reasons, but actually serving other gods. And is that a problem? So let's go to Jesus, Mark chapter 7. Let's go to the third major destruction or judgment on Jerusalem. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. And let's see what Jesus said about the people of his time. Now keep in mind, during Jesus' time, were they doing the sacrifices? Yes. Was, it a, was, was the whole system, the religion, up and running? Were they doing the Sabbaths? Were they doing the festivals? Were they doing the Passover? Were they, were they doing all those things? Did they have a priest in place? Did they have everybody doing their functions and doing their thing? Yes. But what was wrong? It's kind of like during the time of Isaiah, wasn't it? In fact, Jesus noted that, verse 6. Jesus answered and said to them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things you do. You're focused more on whether you have a clean cup. You wor worry more about the, whether they have washed hands. You worry more about whether they have tied the cumin in their cupboard. Rather than what? Do you love your neighbor? <laughs> Are you doing just by those in need? How are they treating the disabled? <laughs> How are they treating the widow? How are they treating their own parents? How <laughs> are these Pharisees are taking houses from their own family? There was, there was no justice. There was no love there, was it? Much like the time of what? Isaiah. So what's going to happen? Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that killed the prophets and stoned them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Kind of like in Jeremiah, right? I, I sent you the prophets, I sent you the things, you wouldn't listen. You, you, you refused me, God says. Verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him to show him the building of the temple. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't it great? We've got this. And are they doing the sacrifices? Yes. Are they functioning when, under the religion? Yes. But what does Jesus say? And Jesus said to them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And who did that? The Romans. And how's that temple doing now? That destruction wasn't for 70 years. That destruction <laughs> continues, doesn't it? Jerusalem's a city split. Jerusalem is not what it's supposed to be, is it? Jerusalem's nowhere near what it's going to be, is it? And God's judgment continues on them to this day. Do you see the progression? I will bring my servants to bring you terror, but I will deliver you. Listen to me. Did they? <laughs> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you away for 70 years. I'm going to bring you back for 70 years. They're going to completely destroy this city. I'm going to bring you back in 70 years. Are you going to listen to me now? No. I'm going to even send my Christ to you, right? Are you, are you going to listen then? Are you, no. <laughs> so I'm going to destroy you. And in the end, what's going to happen? Matthew chapter 24, verses 11 and 12. 
And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax what? Cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now what's going on now? It's a lack of, it's a heart problem. It continues to be a what? Heart problem. Love wax cold. Love toward whom? The only love that's on fire is for ourselves. <laughs> Selfish. That's the only love. How's the love for God going in this world? How's your love for the neighbor going? Even in the church, how's the love for brothers and sisters going? Not always so good. How's our love for enemies going? It's cold. Stone cold sometimes, isn't it? And that's not the way it should be. In fact, let's go to uh, verses 36 through 39, same chapter. What does Jesus say? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, when the judgment shall come. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall all the com- also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They're going to be going about their business, not caring about who. Where will the heart of mankind be? Far from God. Anybody see the con- constant theme here? <laughs> Is there a problem? And how does it exhibit itself? Lack of love for one another. Focus more on religions and the traditions and teachings of men instead of the teachings of God. Love for the things of this world. Love for idols and those ways. And just a stone cold heart against God. And he says, I will bring what? I will bring judgment. So what can we do? <laughs> what do we need to do to turn this around? Well, same past, same books, he gives us the answer. And they're very consistent. In fact, let's go to Isaiah. We're going to read them this way, just to make it easier on yourself. You don't have to flip pages so much. Does that sound good? All right, let's start in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. What do we need to do? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. Very beginning of the book. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like what? Wool, if you are willing. (laughs) What do we need to do? We need to wash our heart clean, right? We need to get back to caring about justice, caring about the oppressed, caring about the fatherless, caring about the widow. That all has to do with our what? Heart. And when it comes to washing, though our sins be as scarlet, that has to do with our heart towards who? God. We need to wash. (laughs) The way we treat each other and the way we we interact with God, we got to get clean, right? In fact, that's the first one. So get clean, right? We need to clean up our act. Isaiah 30, 1 through 3. What else do we need to do? Isaiah 30, 1 through 3. As the Assyrians were marching through Israel, who did Judah turn toward? Egypt. I found that interesting. I always find that interesting they turned to Egypt. Isaiah 31. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that takes counsel, but not of me. And that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan and his ambassadors come to Hanes. 
They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be in help or profit, but a shame and also a reproach. And I find it interesting. And he talks about this also in Jeremiah and elsewhere. Where do we turn for help to fix this problem? And they turn to Egypt. I want you to think about that for a minute. What is Egypt to Israel historically? Their enemy, their former oppressor, their slave owner. <laughs> they enslaved them, didn't they? In fact, it was from Egypt that God set them free by his mighty hand and brought them to the promised land to bless them, right? So now they're afraid they may lose the promised land. They may be driven out by the Assyrians, so they turn back to their captor, to the old ways. How many find that to be a bit odd? In fact, let's go to Jeremiah. Oh, no, I promise we stay here. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Turn to the old ways. Keep that in your mind, right? Turn to our old captor. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14. In chapter 28, we saw last week, talks about the fact that Israel's going down. Ephraim is going to be destroyed, right? And what does he say here in verse 14? Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, because you have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehoods have we hid ourselves. They put themselves, their faith basically in themselves and said what? We will not learn from Israel. We will not learn from what happened to them. By the way, why was Israel destroyed? Because of their pride. Because they, their gods. Because they turned against God. And God finally destroyed them. And yes, he ramped it up on them too. Little by little. More and more and more. He brought captors and people into their life and set them free. And finally he said, I've had enough. And there's Judah saying, well that could never happen to me. You know when the best time to learn is? when somebody else gets in trouble. <laughs> you know, you can learn when you get in trouble, or you can learn when somebody else gets in trouble. Which one's best? Somebody else. <laughs> and they did not learn. And this is what we need to do. We need to make sure, first of all, as we see judgment coming, and is judgment coming, people? In fact, are we in the midst of judgment? We're going to see that in a minute. We're in the midst of judgment now, aren't we? But, what should we do? We need to make sure our heart is clean, don't we? We need to make sure we're doing what's right. We need to make sure our heart is right with God and we are loving Him and loving the people around us, our neighbors and everybody else, those in need and all the rest. We need to make sure we are loving correctly. We need to make sure our heart is right, right? We also need to make sure we're not turning to the old ways, the things that had captured us before. We need to go back and we need to trust, put trust in who to save us? God only and His ways. And then we got to what? We got to learn. <laughs> learn from the times before, right? And why am I saying this? Because Jeremiah said exactly the same thing. Let's go to Jeremiah 4.14. What did he tell them to do before Babylon comes and destroys them? <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14. What does he tell them to do? O Jerusalem, wash your heart <laughs> from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge with thee? We need to make sure we have a clean heart that we love. Who? Love God, love neighbors, love enemies, love one another, love as God loves, right? Help the oppressed, help the fatherless, help the widows, help those in need. Ensure there's justice. That is our, that's what God wants of us, isn't he? And that has to be our desire. He, he loves that much more than just sacrifice, doesn't he? He loves a contrite what? Heart. 
that loves him. That's what he's seeking, not religion, right? What else does he say? Jeremiah 42, 14. Jeremiah 42, 14. <laughs> guess where they wanted to go? Anybody want to guess? Egypt. <laughs> That's Jeremiah 42, 14, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. I will find security and safety in my captors. And the things that held me back, and the things that made me miserable in this world, I will turn to them for security. Does that sound stupid to you? If it does, hold on to your hats and glasses, because uh, <laughs> we're going to see how we do this all the time. Verse 15, And now therefore hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which you feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine, whereof you were afraid, shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there you shall die. <laughs> and he goes on. <laughs> he goes on and on. And if you try to flee there, I'll catch you. And if you try to get away from there, I'll catch you there. <laughs> you can't turn to the world and be set free, can you? Who must you put your trust in? God and his ways, right? So, do not turn to the world <laughs> to save you. It's ways. Don't do that. And then finally... Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, After she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. We've got to learn, don't we? We've got to learn. Learn from those around us, though, as judgment has come, don't we? How many nations in the history of mankind, have turned against God and been just fine. Well, the big strong ones, right? The big ones, the ones with the greatest military. The richest ones, right? They, they've all made it. Oh, United, that's why the United States is going to survive. We're going to be just fine. How many times have the people of God, God's people, turned against God, became very religious, only caring about the things that men have taught cared only about themselves and gone after money and the things of the world, has God said, yeah, that's okay. I'm fine with that. How many churches in the history of mankind have turned against God and God said, yeah, that doesn't bother me? <laughs> Should we be paying attention? We have to pay attention. We have to learn. In fact, let's go to the next, the next example, Acts 2, 23 before the Roman invasion. What did Peter say? What did he beg the people of Jerusalem to do? Acts 2, 23. Uh-oh. Ah, that's the wrong verse. Well, let me tell you what he said. <laughs> I can find it here in a minute, but I'm not going to... Is it one? 
One, huh? Mission of sins? Anyways. He says, cleanse your heart. <laughs> Believe it or not. Is it 123? Nope. All right. Uh, sorry about that. I, bad handwriting sometimes gets me. Acts, Acts, and Peter calls the people and he says what? You crucified Jesus. You killed him. So what do you need to do? Repent. Cleansed, right? You need to do this. You need to repent of your sins. You need to turn. And I, I, want, I want to impress upon you this. That's where we have to start. How many is it, of us times is it so much easier for us to judge how bad those people are out there? And that's why all these bad things are happening to us, because those bad people out there. What is God saying to Jerusalem every time first? It's because of you. <laughs> don't blame the Babylonians, don't blame the Assyrians, don't blame the oppressor, don't blame God, don't blame anybody. Look at you first. Get you right with God. And then, make sure you're not turning to the world and the world's ways and learn from those who have gone before. But we have to look at ourselves too, don't we? How are we doing? And he says to the people there in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost, what? Repent. You have to repent. In fact, let's go to Matthew 23, 23. What did Jesus say? Matthew 23, 23. I hope. Whoa, that's it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you have done, and not to leave the others undone. Is there a place for religion? Is there a place for doing what's right? But the weightier, the more important things are what? Doing the right things. You blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup of the platter and of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. And what was the problem with the Pharisees? This gets to cleansing, but it also gets to what? They were turning to the ways of the world. They said, if we go back to the law, right? If we go back to the law, if we go to the letter of the law, that will save us. But what does Paul say about the law? It only leads to what? Bondage. So don't go back to legalism and say, oh, okay, we need to get right with God. Let's go to legalism. Let's make sure everybody has the right haircut and has the right clothes and says the right things and looks the right way and listens to the right music and does this, that, and the other thing, and then we'll be right. We are, that's going back to whose ways? The world's ways. That's not the way of God. The way of God's is where? The heart. It's not a religion. And the Pharisees were going which way? We're going to make it a religion. And to get right with God, we're going to make it more religion. And we're going to make more men's rules. And we're going to decide how people act. And by the way, he notes that they won't even keep those themselves. Because <laughs> right? they're hypocrites. And they don't really love God. They love themselves. And he says that will not last. So do not... Turn to the ways of the world. Don't go back to the things like Egypt that controlled you. Live free. In who? In Christ. Now, learn. <laughs> How about the book of Revelation? This, the churches. Why did Paul, I mean, wh why did Jesus have John write those letters to those churches? Just so they would know? No, but so that who would know? That we would know. We need to learn <laughs> from the book of Revelation and all the warnings and all the things there about those churches, about those people. And we need to learn from the fact that God's judgment came on them, didn't it? And if God's judgment came on them, will it come on us as well? If the judgment came on the Pharisees, will it come on us as well if we act the same way? If it came on the Jews, will it come on us also if we act like they do? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got to learn, don't we? In fact, let's look at one last spot. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Two more spots here, actually. Hebrews chapter 10, 22. What do we need to do? As we look toward the judgment of God, which is coming, by the way. Isn't it? His judgment is coming. What do we need to do? Hebrews 10, 22. Anybody want to guess what it says? 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near to who? To God. With a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. Right? We need to not be far from God, but our desire should be to get as close as possible to whom? As the judgment comes, get as close as possible to God. Not Ephesians 4, not Egypt. In this case, Egypt is uh, the old ways. The things that kept us bound. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves up to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. Basically he's saying you're saved, that's great, but then don't go back to the old ways, the old ways that kept you captive, the old ways that made you miserable. Don't go back to the hate. Don't go back to the greediness. Don't go back to the selfishness. Don't go back to the judgment. Don't go, go back to all those things before that just help you captive like Egypt, right? Don't go back to them. They can't free you. They can't get you through this life. Instead, turn to who? Go to God. His ways. And His ways are what? Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. <laughs> How long has He been saying that? <laughs> it's pretty simple, isn't it? That's what He's been saying. And we need to then what? We need to learn. Where can we learn these lessons? Here and in the world around us, too. Can't we see? Can't we learn from history? Can't we learn from the Word of God? Can't we learn? That God's not messing around here, right? So we see this consistent message. The Assyrians are coming. I'm not going to let them destroy you, but you better get right with me. You better not turn to Egypt. And you better learn from what happened to Israel. Did they? Nope. Okay, I'm bringing the Babylonians then. <laughs> You better get right with me, cleanse your heart, repent of your ways. You better what? Not turn to Egypt, and you better learn from what happened to Israel. Did they? Nope. Jesus comes on the scene and says what? Get right with me, cleanse your heart, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor yourself. Right? Let's get right with God, repent of your ways, and let's... Not turn back to the ways of this world, back to the law and the things that held us bound. Let us go and let's be free in him and let us learn from what has happened in the past. And they said, crucify him. <laughs> did they learn? And did these happen? Did the Assyrians come and distress them? Didn't destroy them, but distressed them. Did Babylon come and destroy them? And were they captive for 70 years? And did the Romans destroy them? Terrible destruction. I always encourage everybody to take a read about that. It's an amazing piece of history, uh, what they did to Jerusalem. And by the way, is God going to bring his judgment upon this whole world? Isaiah even said so. <laughs> Isaiah even said, hey, and this judgment's coming on the whole world someday, right? So what do we need to do? We need to make sure our heart is right with God. Why are we doing the things we do? Because we love him. What do we do? Why do we do what we do for other people? Because we love them, right? Why do we seek justice and help the oppressed and the widows and the orphans? Why do we do that? Because we love them. And we love God, right? Don't turn to the old ways of the world. <laughs> Our old ways that kept us bound. Don't, don't turn to their methods. They're not going to free us, are they? And let us learn. Learn from these ways. So, just noticed a pattern in this, so I thought I'd share that. That gets us through several chapters here in Isaiah, but that's basically his point. His point in all these chapters is, don't go to Egypt and learn. <laughs> Get your right heart, heart right with him, because uh, judgment is coming. And unlike Israel in these cases, uh, we need to make sure we're listening to the prophets, aren't we? And not ignoring the word of God. So, and where does it start? In your own heart. And who is there to help you understand what's going on in your heart? <laughs>
In fact, I always say what Jesus said. You know the best way to determine what's going on in your heart? Listen what's coming out of your mouth. Right? Out of the depths of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what kind of stuff is coming out of your mouth? Are those things pleasing to God? And if they're not, who will help us clean it up? Holy Spirit's always there, right? To help us clean it up, make sure we're right with him. And that we're not turning to the ways of this world. We are learning. So we are ready for that judgment day. Any questions? Let's pray.